Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Sander Lanch podcast. Today, we read Shadows of Self, chapters four and five, wherein Wax and Wayne and Marisai all go and investigate uh, the scene that we saw uh, back in chapter one and draw some conclusions from that. And then they each, chapter five is kind of each of them on their own little uh, little journey. Wax goes to meet uh, his grandmother, and Wayne goes to meet... Someone from his life that's uh, got a, an important soul of her own. And then uh, Marisai is talking to her boss. So it's, it's kind of an interesting chapter. I don't know that we've had one uh, quite like that before. So I am Data, and with me is... Jamie. And Dak. No Joe today. Uh, he's. I think he's going to submit uh, a little clip that I can cut in after this to be like, here's what I thought. Maybe he'll even say and Joe, and I'll put that after I've just explained he's not here. I'll put it there anyway. <laughs> Anyway, hang on to something, everyone. The Sander Lanch is about to begin. Riddle me this now and riddle me that. Does anyone really know the mind of the bat? Wherever you're going, whatever you do, a man in the dark keep them watch over you. So poison the ivy with your crocodile tears. We're climbing the vines to the heart of your fears. Can you tell me has something changed? Rewards are zero cause I ain't no hero Do you know it when you go strange? Is your taunting true? Am I as crazy as you? Check my head, I guess the joke's on me So yeah, uh, Joe's opinion, maybe maybe his will go first once I've edited in Hey everyone, it's Joe Sorry I couldn't make the episode this week But I didn't want to let an episode pass without letting you all know what my thoughts were about the chapters that we read. So this week, we were reading Shadows of Self, chapters 4 and 5. And I have to say, the first chapter was was very interesting. We've got to see Wax kind of do his investigation type thing. Um, Marisai... She, you kind of get to see her place in things these days with her working as part of the constabulary. And uh, we get to see this new captain who I really, really like. Uh, really, everything about the guy seems very interesting to me. Um, just his background, his history, and, and basically what he's doing now at this point in the story. And so we get to see Wax do his investigation, get to find out that this person was a steel runner, um, they're a fair chemist that stores speed. That's just a really cool uh, ability and a really cool way to kind of be uh, using that ability. Um, we also get some background into the brother of the governor himself, how Marisai has already formed theories about the governor being possibly corrupt as well. And I, I just think all of that was uh, very well done in that first chapter. And if that wasn't enough, we get to the next chapter, and I liked it even more. I would say that some of the problems that I, I think I think maybe what what's more interesting to me about this book is that a lot of the problems seem extremely relatable or at least things that in the history of maybe our society, especially especially as um, I'm an American, so especially as like an American, you see kind of this history play out with an industrial revolution or just jobs being taken over by by basically technology and industry and things like that and people being left out of work and and being displaced. So that's all pretty interesting stuff to me. So yeah, Wax's uh, relationship with his grandmother, very interesting as well. Wayne, we get to see kind of behind the mask a little bit with him, and he's going to visit the daughter of the person that he killed, and he always delivers the money in person. And it's it's a sad story, but it's also very humanizing for him, I think. And so it was kind of cool to get to see that. I'd say the only thing that I really disliked about this chapter specifically was that we don't um, we get kind of this split perspective throughout the entire set of chapters here except for the first one with the investigation this second chapter we get split perspectives it almost felt like a lantris like if if this was a lantris each of those sections would have been written um together instead of mixed up and we would have just got one after another and it would have been three chapters as opposed to to one and i even thought to myself hey this chapter is kind of long not that it doesn't work it just it seemed kind of long so i was like oh that's interesting this is a longer chapter but uh it covered a lot of a lot of stuff so yeah so overall really enjoyed these chapters so 
that being out of the way, I'm going to kind of move on to what I think might be happening next. So we have Marisai. She's going to go check out the, um, the governor and his speech and see how the people react to the speech. And, and maybe we'll get kind of an insight there as to what the governor is like because we haven't seen him up to this point. And also, my my prediction for that is she's going to run into somebody there at the speech that maybe is going to notice her and um, probably inform whoever the big bad is that she's snooping around. So I think maybe that's what we'll see on, on her end. Maybe not, but that's just something that I could see potentially happening. So Wax, at the same time, with the help of his grandmother, he's now after this steel runner. So I think he's going to track down leads. Wayne will probably join up with him, I think. And they're going to work it from a different angle. And and what I hope is that our three protagonists are going to kind of collide here in the next set of chapters and um, be able to kind of work together um, from different angles to kind of solve this, just like they have in the past. But yeah, I'm really interested to see where this goes. There seems like there's a lot of mystery going on here right at the outset. You know, we're five chapters in and we're almost like a quarter of the way through the book, too. So we've already covered quite a bit of ground uh, just in this, in this, what feels like this first little bit. So there's a big mystery to solve. We've got a piece of the mystery, but not the whole puzzle. Um, so yeah, I'm really looking forward to, uh, to what we see next. But yeah, this has the potential to be really good. I'm really enjoying it so far. I uh, hope you guys are, too. Sorry, I, I couldn't be there this week. Um, <laughs> I just schedules were conflicting, and uh, what I'm really bummed out about is that I I can't hear what everybody else is thinking about it this week because this edit won't go up until uh, until the show goes up. So I'll actually have to listen to the show this time. I don't normally listen, but I want to get everybody. I want to hear everybody else's perspective. So, uh, but yeah, that's all I really have for this week. So, uh, wasing to the time of next, Colo. You two think of the two chapters that we read this time. Yeah, I'm I'm still liking it. Obviously, it's a, a little bit less eventful, I guess, than the first three chapters that we read yesterday. I also really like that chapter with them sort of going off on their own. I didn't sort of realise, and I don't know if I missed it or if we just haven't spoken about it, that Wax's terrace connection was actually so close. Mm-hmm. And I, I really like seeing, I guess, what the terrorists are up to and how they're living. And, I mean, Wax doesn't want to go there for, I guess, obvious reasons it revealed in the chapter. It was not a pleasant time for him, but it sounds like a really nice place and community. Right. You know, he's like, oh, we're going into the village. I was like, oh, like the village. Okay, cool. <laughs> this is, I wonder what's so bad about the village. Oh, no, like the terrorist village. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so a bit, bit sensitive for him. Wayne. I mean, this is the this is the obviously the one he spoke about in the last book that he still gives the money to the family of the the guy that he killed. Really interested in her name though. It's like a bit of a mashup between Aldrian and uh, Aldrian and Beldry, isn't it? Mm-hmm. I, I wonder how close this this person is related in the line to the High Imperial line somewhere. I don't know. I just was like, wow, that's quite a name put together. <laughs> Two of my favorite characters from uh, yeah. the first. <laughs> They're just the best. You know, I'm kind of sad Wayne didn't rock up and go, I know why you're sad. Uh, <laughs> well, he does know why she's <laughs> sad. Yeah, but. Yeah, yeah. But the, kind of mean with, to just rub the, in all the time. <laughs> yeah, no, don't run. Don't, don't. <laughs> but with, with those names, it's kind of like, I know why you're sad. You can't go shopping. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Also, the university, I, I'm so upset that Joe's not here to talk about <laughs> more material. What, what is that? And you know what? Okay, wasn't the knowledge of the what's or what, whatever. I, I actually took a photo of it because I don't have the book in front of me. Hang on. Give me a sec. Because it just, oh, hang on. baby photos. There we go. Wasn't the always of wanting of knowing. It's bad enough on its own. Then you get the interpretation. The eternal desire of a hungry soul is knowledge. Yeah, uh, clearly. Why not say that? Why not say that? <laughs> why? why do we have to dumb it down for a university? Like, uh, this is what sort of backwards world is this where this is <laughs> talk? Uh, anyway, I've got it out now. We're feeling much better about that. <laughs> I'm very keen to hear Joe's input on that because it's just ridiculous. Why? <laughs> Luke. Yeah. Okay. And Marisai off to to do her thing. Nice to know she got this 
position on her own merit. I <laughs> does anyone else hear J. Jonah Jameson for the captain? Was it, is it oh, what's Aridale? It? Aridale? Yeah. Just those I, last couple I of I didn't, but now that you've said that. Yeah, now I'm going to. <laughs> <laughs> Just the way that he <laughs> the way that he talks, all that that's the delivery I could hear. And I was like, yep, I love it. I love it. This is great. <laughs> He's standing over the corpse and he's like, I, I didn't say bring me bodies. I said bring me pictures of Spider-Man. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> yeah, good read though. Still still good in putting together some of the story. Not really any new information on, I guess, what happened in the, the, the ballroom or the auction. But we now have a suspect, which is cool. Yeah. You know, and a terrorist suspect. Yeah. And yeah, I, I like the idea of the steel runner, like seeing how that comes to play and um, you know shooting from different directions and stuff. I thought that was really cool. So I'm looking forward to solving this crime. Yeah, I, it's interesting you bring up Wax's like terrorist heritage because I don't think I think you're I, I think you're right. We, I don't think we knew before now exactly. I mean, him and Wayne we are both related to the terrorists, obviously, but I don't uh, think we know how like, close either of them are. Yeah. Or didn't yes. before now. Uh, it just seemed like that was just something that got passed down through the ages, not something so direct. Right. And you got to wonder, like, did Miles have, like, a parent or grandparent living in the village also or something? Like, this is all how, – how far can you be from the terrorist's uh, main line and still end up with these powers? Yeah, I mean, well, it sounds like – I'm assuming it's his mother. His oh, yeah, terror? I think it must have been, yeah. Yeah, to, to you know, have so much, I guess – influence over his upbringing like it would have to be the father have to be the father that was noble yeah but yeah at at what point i guess did they leave the line i guess they're sort of pure blooded up until that point and then so the allomancy is the recent addition for him rather Mm. than having the ferrochemical ability in there yeah yeah i wonder if that's like even more frowned upon is it's not just like a terrorist person marrying a non-terrorist person but a terrorist person marrying someone from like this high bloodline where there's allomancy is like a good possibility. Is that even like more Romeo and Juliet than it would otherwise be? Yeah. And also what happened to, to make that so bad? Like surely when says became harmony and things sort of got reborn and, you know, everything that obviously Vin and Ellen did as allomancers to bring the world back. I know the terrorists didn't exactly come out of everything great, yeah, what what's happened in the last three hundred years to make this community of terrorists just so anti Alamancer? Well, I think his grandmother mentions something about it, doesn't she? Like about like basically the Lord Ruler has got them scared of mixing these two lines. Maybe I'm making that up. She did say something along those lines, yeah. His grandmother, that's a an interesting woman. <laughs> yeah, firm firm terrorists. Yeah, like this, like these, these, these were okay. Um, I feel like the chapter where they they came to Winston's little, uh, like the site the site of the massacre. Like there wasn't a lot of new information there. Like the the whole steel runner perspective was pretty cool, but aside from that, a lot of it was just walking us through what we already knew. So I know it's I know it's necessary to tell the story because they have to find out at some point. But I, I felt like it just sort of dragged a little bit. It could have been a bit quicker. Mm. I don't know. Maybe maybe that's just a, a, a matter of perspective. If if it had been from Wax's or possibly even Wayne's perspective, we would have like because they were more focused on that. But Marisol's got her own stuff going on with the rest of the department, so it sort of dragged on a bit. But I guess that was still necessary to tell. But I really liked the bits where we just see them going off and doing their stuff for a day, you know, getting inside. This is their lives now, or like this is just what they get up to when they're not in the group and solving crimes together. So that was really cool, especially Wayne's, because that was just like, we're so used to him just being the funny guy. And every so often we just get this reminder that, no, he actually has a very tragic backstory and he is just constantly you know, punishing himself for what he did. But he also has quite a bit of integrity to face up to these people and saying, I am doing this for you. I don't ever expect your forgiveness, but I'm not going to, hand it off to someone else to do this. I will do it myself. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Like, Wayne is... Wayne is very very rapidly climbing my list of favourite characters. Like, even even when he's being an obnoxious twit, I just can't bring myself to be annoyed at him for it. 
just knowing everything else I, I do about him. So I'm, I'm, I'm getting very attached to Wayne. And yeah, meeting the terrorists was interesting. I spent that whole thing going like, wait, so Says reshaped the world but didn't give the terrorists back their mountains. Hmm. That's interesting. Uh, yeah, that was may, maybe he wanted to encourage them to work with the, like the other the other people more closely, which is why they've got their little hideaway set up right in the center of town. But it did seem it was like. You, like you took away like their their frozen lands of, of snow and rock that they loved so much. You took away Canada. Uh, <laughs> that's not fair. You took away Finland. And yeah, like it it just seems oh all they get now is this one tiny little village. Whereas before, like they were like they had this massive landscape to call their own. It just that 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 was a bit weird coming from Sazed. But uh, no, I like the conversation. It was nice to see. Another side to the terrorist people, I guess, because previously, like, they were all super helpful, aside from Rashek. So it was good to be reminded, it's like, no, these, like, there are different personalities in amongst uh, this people. So we can just get different perspectives on what they think is right. So I, I don't know, I appreciated that. I thought Grandma V is a really interesting character as well, so I'll be looking forward to seeing more of her. And, uh, yeah, Marisai joined the force. That was pretty cool. Again, really good to see that she got there on her own merits. Yeah, I won't be able to unsee J. Jonah Jameson. That was right. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> I think I assume that like the idea after the world was destroyed and remade or whatever is that there were so few survivors that everyone needed to stick together. Because I mean there there are mountains in the world and probably snowy ones that they could have moved to, but if there's just there's not enough people to keep going, you got everyone has to work together, at least at the beginning. I'm not sure there are snowy mountains though, because they say the Elendil Basin is like it's you no, know, it's it's all lush and greenery inside the basin. Then you got the mountains surrounding them, and then outside that is the roughs, just yep. hot, windswept desert. So how far are the terrorists gonna have to go to find any windswept mountains? Because they got desert on all sides at the moment. That's true. I mean, I guess there's ocean on one side or whatever, because there's a bay and then some ocean. But yeah, then it's just there's mountains yeah. around the edges, and so I mean, they could have gone to those mountains, I guess, around the edge of the basin if they really wanted to. Um, I don't know if any of their animals survived. They were herdsmen, but the, maybe they could find some new sheep or something. I mean, even then, like, um, like I think Grandma V even says it, it's like the rough, hot, disgusting places. Like, <laughs> well, probably not going to like the like the mountains that border them then. Yeah, maybe not. That's a good point. We don't. We haven't spent much time in that direction to know kind of how uh, how things are, except for the couple of chapters of wax in the roughs. Yeah. You think there'd have to be a cold climate somewhere? Like if if the planet has been put back to where it was originally, well, the terrorists were around obviously before the planet got moved because Rushek did that. So somewhere on the planet, you'd think there would have to be an ideal place. But yeah, I guess their numbers they were they were dwindling so much, like they couldn't have kept going with just who they had. They would have had to have integrated with society a little bit. Maybe they could go, you know, for a holiday or something to the. <laughs> <laughs> but also, if everyone's congregated in the middle, maybe yeah, they haven't explored that. They've been so busy of setting themselves back up. No one's gone back out yet if they don't have to. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't sound like there's a lot of people doing a lot of exploring out there. That was one of the. Um, so I'm, I'm looking at the map now, and there is definitely a road that goes out north past Callingfail, past the Tyrian Sea. Mm-hmm. We don't see where that goes, but so that's that's out through the roughs and going wherever whatever's north. So yeah, I don't know. Well, and I mean, yeah, I like I, I was with Jamie. Just, I'm like, I assume there's snowy mountains somewhere, but Dak has a point that it's like if they don't know where that is, then how long might they be wandering? It's going to turn in. You're going to turn the the terrorist people into like the Israelites wandering for 40 years in the desert looking for their homeland. Yeah. Okay, I guess let's let's get into these two whole chapters we start right where we left off after marisai has uh, blown this dude's head off off more more or less and wax's first thought is like man there's a big chunk of his face missing we're not gonna be able to identify him very easily ew and he's like oh wait don't worry about that there's more important things going on and marisai <laughs> is like covered with gore and like just staring straight ahead very clearly uh not uh, taking it real well i mean fair huh? no yeah absolutely fair but I just mean Wax is like, oh, right, I have to be like a human being for a second and help my friend. And uh, she's just like, that that was unexpected of me, wasn't it? And then for this whole first section, Wax keeps trying to talk to her. And she's just like, what? 
what? What? <laughs> you discharged a pistol right beside your head. You're going to have trouble hearing. What? Yeah, okay. <laughs> and Wayne stumbles out of the alley with a crossbow bolt in his hand and a hole in his clothes. So I guess he's probably just healed a crossbow uh, wound. And Maris says, I guess so much for interrogating him. And Wax says, no, it's all right. Living was more important. What? <laughs> just... We we understand you can't hear Marisai. Just just stop. But I mean, probably fair and accurate. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> She's like, why does this keep happening to me? Yes, I know I won't be able to hear you. Just I just this is the third time someone's tried to use me as a hostage. Do I exude indefensibility or something? And Wax is thinking, yeah, actually you do. But that's a good thing. It makes people underestimate you. And then he's comparing her to Lessie again, like. Marisai is uh, is clever and stuff and thinks clearly, but uh, she also likes to dress nicely and use makeup. And Leslie would have never done something like that. I wonder how, like, so Marisai did all her research on wax in the past. It's like, did she, like she had to have known about Leslie and presumably right? their relationship. Yeah, you would think, right? So yeah, I wonder if like she's she never brings it up, but I'm wondering if she's just got a massive chip on her shoulder about that sort of thing because like. This chapter and then the next one, she's constantly second guessing like her qualifications and like her abilities and stuff like, and and her actions. I'm like, no, you partic- like you participated in bringing down one of the biggest criminals in Ellendale, right? Like, and you have you have performed some incredible feats. You don't need to be so hard on yourself all the time. But she's constantly just still shooting down her achievements. Well, and I think she is. We kind of established in the last book that she has a bit of a, a a thing about that because of basically being told her whole life how worthless she is. Yeah, true. I'd forgotten about that. And uh, Reddy shows up. I believe he's he's called Constable Reddy here. I think they said Captain earlier, but and he's come to get wax. It's like Lord Ladrian. Excellent work, my lord. Another miscreant dealt with, and with your customary efficiency, which is not fair because he did not kill that guy. Neither marksman or the other guy. And then Wayne, being Wayne, he's like, hey, look, I think I found one of this, that fella's teeth. That's good luck, ain't it? Uh, thanks, Wayne. Hey, Wayne, make a bullet out of it. <laughs> but Reddy is really like, hey, um, I was on my way to find you when I heard about this. There's another case that the Constable General's at that we kind of want you to come and take a look at. Politics is involved. And so Wax grabs Wayne and they head off and she's feeling away about not being included. Although she's also covered with, like, brains and bits of skull, probably. So I don't know that I would assume that she would want to go ahead and just come on to the next thing right now. But again, chip, shoulder. Yeah. <laughs> Captain Reddy comes up. Constable Combs, you're out of uniform. Yes, sir. It's my day off. And so she's starting to hear a little bit. It says she had to strain over the ringing in her ears and guess a little bit. But she got there to what he was saying. How is it that you find your way consistently into situations like this, despite explicitly being told it is not your assignment? You are not a field constable. Pure happenstance, I'm sure, sir. And he sneers at her, and she thinks, that's funny, he usually saves those looks for wax when the guy's not looking. So, Reddy's not a big fan of wax either, I guess, even though he's uh, being very professional uh, when speaking directly to the man. Wax even commented on that earlier. He's like, why do I always want to hit this guy? Yeah, he doesn't like him either. It's a good point. (laughs) And Reddy's like, look, You've obviously been through a lot. Go home, get cleaned up, report for duty tomorrow. And she's like, no, I want to tell Captain Aradell about my pursuit of Marksman and his subsequent demise before the details become fuzzy. He'll be interested as he's followed the case personally. And so they have a bit of a staring contest because while Reddy technically outranks her, he's not her boss. Aradell is the boss to both of them. So he's just like, "Uh, well, the Consul General's not in the office right now. Okay, well, then I'll just go straight to him and let him dismiss me if that's his wish. And Reddy can't argue that, and he's kind of annoyed about it. But, All uh, makes they, sense now knowing what we know later. Right. But, yeah, at this point, she's she's she doesn't understand why this guy dislikes her so much, and she's going to say that later. But, yeah, it makes sense uh, when you find out that she took what he saw as his job. And so uh, she shows up at the same place with uh, Wax and Wayne, and Wax is like, do you know what this is about? And she's like, what, no, they didn't tell you? And he shakes his head. So it's all very hush-hush. And Reddy says, we've been trying to keep it under wraps a little bit, but uh, word is going to get out. Lord Winsting is involved. The governor's brother? <laughs> they go inside this uh, this fancy place that uh, Winsting Innate, that's what we find out his name is, Winsting Innate, owns. And uh, as they come in, Wayne pockets a small decorative cigar box, Citizen's Magistrate's brand, which is that, the expensive brand that Miles preferred last book. 
I thought it was the same and I was like, oh, oh, might be a clue. Mm. Not to Miles, but <laughs> yeah. one who who employed Miles. Mm. Yeah, hopefully Miles is pretty dead. I mean, we watched him die. I feel like not a lot coming back from that. You wouldn't think, right? Yeah, no. Unless he's going to Andrew just... got a hold of his bones. I was about to like... say the same thing. Like, the kid just going to get his bones too. And just pl- just planting the, and... the cigar box as a false trail. <laughs> and shared a love for the same cigars? <laughs> Well, you know, the, the 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 best conjurer do a bunch of research about the people they're impersonating so they can step into the role really convincingly. That is true. He replaces the decorative cigar box with a bruised apple, and she's like, damn, I'm going to have to make sure he swaps those back before we leave. Okay, I do have to say, like, Wayne, I don't know how you justify that as a fair trade. I bet you, like, the box is empty or something. He's like, oh, it's an empty box. It's not useful for anything. This apple's useful. Yeah, it's it. evident, Wayne. <laughs> yeah between this and the whole like the tickets to the ball swapped with a very nice leaf later on <laughs> like, leaf, i forgot about that uh wayne wayne i need to know your thought process on this because i don't get how that's a fair trade it's just that's the way wayne sees things he's like this very nice leaf is a rarity you've never seen a leaf this nice oh gosh no one gives a shit about leaves wayne <laughs> So they get up to the ballroom and find a bunch of dead people, but we knew that part already. And we meet Claude Aradell, Constable General of the Fourth Octant, pushing 60, though he would not divulge his true age. And even Octant Records had a question mark next to his birth date. I love that. <laughs> and they, they come in, and Wayne's like, oh, the fun's already over, seeing all the dead people. And Wax is like, I, I know some of these dead guys. That's Chip Arakel. Thought to run smuggling in the third octant. House Arakel, I believe, was one of the great houses back in Luthadel in the first book. Was it? I think I remember so. remember that one. It was one of like the lesser known ones. I, the only reason I remember it is because it's in the game. Uh, you play the great houses in the board game, the house war game. And so uh, yeah, some okay. of the ones that don't get more than like a single mention in the book get you know more detail in the game. And Marisai's like, and that's Isabelline Frelia. We have a file on her as tall as Wayne. So, yes. As as we were aware, these are a bunch of uh, shady types, a bunch of criminals, and some noblemen uh, of more dubious reputation. And Wax is like, why would anyone eliminate this? Like, this is crazy. While on the other hand, Wayne is like, hey, like half the half the criminal elite in town are dead. We should be throwing a party. Someone went and did our work for us. We can take the month off. Oh, Wayne, like, this is not a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> this is like every. Um, superhero show that involves the cops ever. You've always got the one cop that's like, man, vigilantes cannot do this. And the other cop's just like, we couldn't touch these guys. We should be thanking them. Mm. But Marisai points out, it's like, whoever did this, this was a like enormous ambition, eliminating rivals wholesale. And Wax is just like, it doesn't make sense. Like, it taking out so many of the underworld powers is not going to favor the perpetrators. That's a myth. <laughs> From penny novels, murders on this scale just draw attention and unify opposition from every other surviving gang as soon as the word gets out. And Marisai says, well, unless it's done by an outsider because, uh, you know, someone who doesn't have a stake already so that if the entire system crumbles, they are the ones who benefit. Which just made me think, so all the criminals are now meeting somewhere underground and then they all hear this weird laughing and a dude in a purple suit yep. rocks up, starts doing magic tricks with pencils. That was exactly my thought in that same place. I'm like, yeah, it, their theory is that the Joker has come to town and started yeah. just killing off the gangs because why the hell not? You think you could steal from us and walk away? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, I haven't watched that movie in ages. I should do that again. I watched it not too long ago because uh, I don't know if the kids had seen it and it was, I was scrolling through Netflix and found it and I was like, you know, what? we're watching this. Fair enough. I don't know if we even finished the whole thing. I know we got through the hospital exploding, but uh, I don't remember if we got much further. But yeah, so he's like, so you guys said the governor's brother was involved? Lord Winston Innate, head of House Innate. So he has a seat on the Senate in the same way that Wax does, because Wax is the head of his house. So in the in the uh, the Chamber of Lords, half of the Senate, basically. And so it says that he gained that seat after his brother was elevated to governor. So I guess if you become governor, you can't be like the head of your house for voting purposes anymore. It makes sense. Yep. The problem was, apparently, it's well known that this guy uh, is corrupt. 
And that's what Ariel says. He's like, we've we've long suspected he was crooked, but the people love his family. And his brother went to great lengths to keep Winsting's previous lapses out of the limelight. And Wayne's like, well, maybe he didn't know these guys were bad guys. And Mara says, like, yeah, n- probably not. That's probably not the case. And even if that were true, it wouldn't matter because once this gets out and the newspapers are talking about how the governor's brother is dead in a house full of criminals, then uh, this is going to seem very bad. And Wayne's response is, so what I'm hearing is the fun isn't over. <laughs> Meanwhile, Wax is looking at the bodies and she, as she notes in her head, basically, he's used to working on his own out in the middle of nowhere. So he has to be able to do all the jobs himself. He knows how to examine the crime scene do some uh, CSI type work at least a bit. And so Wax is like, so look, look at how the bodies fell. If this was an unexpected hit by someone from the outside, like they would have rocked up and just shot everybody. Right. But that's not what happened. These people were shooting at each other. And then we find out that several of them were killed by a knife in the back instead of bullets. So that just adds to the weirdness. And I like, he's like, Miss Combs, Wax says, what is your, what do your statistics tell you about this kind of violence? And she's like, oh, so we're using last names now, are we? Fine. And she says, I, I love that line, just in her <laughs> internal. Like, oh, well. <laughs> like, dude, just settle down. You've got a job to do. She, I, she, I, Dax got a, is on to something with, like, she's got a big chip on her shoulder. And she's just uh, taking a lot of stuff real personally that I, I'm, I'm not arguing that maybe she deserves to take some of it personally. But I feel like she's not concentrating on the right things at all times here. Yeah. Like I, I I think she's she's better than she gives herself credit for, but then there are some things I'm just like, you don't need to be focusing on this. Like you don't need to worry about this. Like just, you know, move on. Mm. And she says, I can count on the fingers of one hand the number of times something like this has happened. Which struck me strange at first until you remember this is like one city and it's only been around for like three hundred years. So yeah, there's not a lot of time for really crazy events to have happened several times. And uh she says the one most likely behind it is actually dead. And Wax is like, oh, yeah, Lord Winston. So you're saying that, like, the most likely scenario is that he lured them here and planned to kill them. Which, yeah, I mean, he if he's the one who organized them being here and if someone wanted them all dead, yeah, that, that's what makes the most sense is that the person who arranged for them to be here is the one who wanted them dead. But he's also dead, so that doesn't really work. And we've been inside his head and know that that's not the case anyway. Yeah, I mean, we all know they should be looking at who's not there. Yeah. And so apparently the police have heard rumors that he was thinking about putting up his Senate vote for sale. So he's not as slick as he thought. But he's like, regardless, killing all the people willing to pay him would be like blasting your silver mine with dynamite trying to find gold. Which that's a fun uh, that's a fun simile there. When they get down to the safe room, there's four guard corpses and they were all shot from behind from the direction of the safe room. And Wax immediately draws the conclusion that. She, Because Mary says, like, how'd the killer get them to just stand there and take four shots to the back? And Wax says he didn't. He moved too fast for them to respond. And Wayne's like, ah, oh, crap, a ferrochemist, a steel runner, which we've been talking about steel runners recently. So they're kind of convenient. The governor's brother was still sitting in the chair, throat slit, killed with some sort of long knife or small sword. Even more strange, his tongue was cut out. Yeah, that's weird. Yeah. I mean, I get the whole... So I, I the the people who were stabbed in the back with knives, I picture they were probably like trying to like just duck for cover and get out, and then whoever went back, whoever came in and just finished like was just mopping things up, just went stab, 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 and just got rid of them. I don't know what purpose taking the tongue of this guy is. Mm. Yeah, I guess that would make well, sense. Sounds like a message, doesn't it? But I don't know who you're leaving the message for if you've killed. Everyone. If you kill everyone. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it was a message for Batman. I mean wax or the police. message for the governor yeah or the Maybe. governor yeah just somebody who's going to show yeah. up after the fact yeah, yeah. yeah. so taking what well, taking his Someone. tongue so he's lost his voice you're going to lose your voice next or like i don't know maybe it's a discredit this is like one of you like you're going to be either killed or discredited so yeah you know or you you talk this is what happens to you something i don't know yeah. this is what you happens snitch. to rats yeah uh, he wasn't really a rat though so maybe that didn't make any sense well no but he was going to use his voice for for evil. So, some 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 purpose that whoever killed him didn't like, so. Mm, okay. I don't know. Maybe. Just spitballing here. And also, you, you you said, oh, it's a message for Wax. No, it's a message for Batman. I'm like, message for Waxman? <laughs> so I, I only said it because I was thinking about the Batman and how the Riddler was leaving the clues behind for Batman. Oh, point, that. yeah. I just, I just thought, well, you got 
Batman, wax, wax man. Yes, father, I shall become a candle. <laughs> wax man would be a really lame uh, comic book villain. I think that's what he's aiming for. We have a beautiful new candelabra at home. He's just getting ready. Uh, yes. To now. Oh my god. <laughs> It's like that's that's how he announces his presence to no, to criminals. He's just in the rafters above them and drips wax on their heads. <laughs> and they What's look, that? they do that, they do the thing where they look up just in time to see him jump on them. Oh no, it's Wax Man! Run! It's the Wax Man! <laughs> and like the CSIs are scrubbing, uh, scrubbing the crime scene. It's like, what is that? Is that blood? No, that's wax. <laughs> oh, it's red wax. I wouldn't even think of that. Yeah, that's scary. <laughs> Because it's, especially if it goes on concrete, it's really hard to get that out. Yeah. <laughs> Aerodil's like, I don't know why the killer didn't use a gun on this guy. And Wax says, because the guards were still alive then. They let the killer pass. It was someone they trusted, maybe even one of their number. They let the murderer into the safe room. And Mara says, like, well, I mean, or maybe he just moved really quick. Wax is like, maybe, but that door was unlocked from the inside and has not been forced. There's people, so they could have seen who was coming. Which is true, but we know that they opened the door to let the bodyguard in, so somebody really fast could have come in, like, at the same, like, behind him, basically. I don't know. Good old Flog. Did they find the body of Flog, though? Because I'd sort of assumed I don't know. it was Flog. There's a bunch well, of dead bodyguards. I don't know that it, they, they would know his name. Yeah, they mm. just, they, they said, oh, we've got a whole bunch of notable corpses plus a whole bunch of guards, so if Flog's body was among the mess, they probably just don't give a shit right now. Yeah. Because no one cares about the working class. <laughs> and Aaron was like, oh, Also, crap. do we know if it actually was Flog who went back in and said they're all dead? Like, it could have been someone else. Um, I'm going to go back. I'm pretty sure it said it was Flog, but now I'm going to go back and look to see. Back to chapter one. Yeah, it's got Flog comes back into the room and says they're all dead as he walks yeah. into the room. Yeah. It doesn't yeah, say okay. he's the, It doesn't say he's the one that kills Winston, but... Like, no, we just, yeah, we just kind of made that jump because he is the guy who was standing by him, basically. He's, he's definitely in the room when it happens. So, yeah, who knows? Could have still been Flog. Maybe Flog's the ferrochemist, chemist, although it doesn't sound like that's likely, given what we find out later. Because I believe Grandmother says specifically it's not a man. And then uh, Aridel's like, oh, crap, a ferrochemist? chemist, are you sure? And Wayne says, yeah, you can't, it could have been a speed bubble. You can't shoot out of those. So either this is a ferrochemist or someone has figured out how to shoot out of a speed bubble, which is something we'd really like to know how to do. Which isn't impossible because a lot of things, a lot of times in these books, uh, is people like hearing, oh, these are things you can't do with these arts and then finding some way to do them anyway. So, yep. yep. My only thought there at this point is we know that aluminum is hard to affect with allomancy. So I wonder if maybe an aluminum bullet. Uh, yeah. Definitely possible. Well, probable. Uh, let's see. So someone moving with ferrochemical speed explains the knife deaths above. A few swift executions in the chaos while everyone else was shooting. Quick and surgical. And so he says steel runners aren't common, even as ferrochemists go, so I'll look into it. And, there, and Marisai asks about the press, and Aerodel's like, well, we can't keep a lid on this, not with this many people involved. It's going to get out. And Wax says, let it, but I can't help feeling that that's the point of all of this. And Wayne says, what? I thought the point was killing folks. And Wax says, a lot of folks. A shift in power in the city. And then he goes, they removed the tongue. Why? What are you up to, uncle? And Aridel's like, what What was that? What? Nothing. Nothing. Um, I got to go sit for a portrait. Send me a report, please. And he says, and Captain, prepare for a storm. This wasn't done quietly. It was done to be noticed. Whoever did this is likely to stop here. So, yes, more to come. And that is the very dramatic end of part one. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> part one of, hold on, I want to see how many parts there are in this one. Looks like there's three parts. Damn. So, yeah. So we cut to the second, or to chapter five, rather, which Wayne tugs on his lucky hat, a coachman's hat, which is like a wide-brimmed bowler, only didn't have three ounces of fancy shoved up its backside. So, yeah, maybe that's the same. I think w when we saw him in the flashback, uh, Wax said that the hat was something like a bowler. So maybe that maybe it is the same hat. And so Wayne is walking through Wax's house. Or I guess Wayne lives here, too. So <laughs> and uh, he's thinking about how bad today is going to be. He was tempted to call it the worst day of his life, but that would certainly be an exaggeration. The worst day of his life would be the one he when he died. Might die today, though. <laughs> Can't on, be certain yet. This is my favorite part of this. He's like when he's talking about how he heals. Like, you know, when when he puts the healing in and he says, oh, yeah, when I'm hung over, 
I just I start putting more and more health because I already feel like shit. I may as well just feel like more shit. I'm like, oh god, I could not imagine anything worse. <laughs> no, that's good. He's like, I'm just gonna be lying around feeling like crap all day, so may as well get something out of it. Yeah, I mean, I follow his train of logic, but fuck. I've never been hungover, so I, I don't have that experience. Yeah, not fun. <laughs> so I've heard. And like it says, uh, the only reason he really stays with Wax is because of the free food. Well, that and because Wax needs company to keep him from going more strange. Lost house as much. Right. You know he's really here because he wasn't gonna doing well without Wax uh, back in town. Or in, yep. uh, in Weathering. Sorry, it took me a minute to remember the name. I feel like it must just be so interesting to see the world from Wax, uh, Wayne's perspective. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, Wayne's not doing so good. Like, no. Mm. <laughs> Look at yourself, buddy. <laughs> Look, there are times where I just think, how have you stayed out of jail? Right? I assume for most of the time it was because he was out in the roughs with Wax, and Wax did his best to keep him out of trouble. Wax is the person who would be putting him in jail in the first place, so he's probably like, okay, look, give it back, apologize, can we please? But yeah, yeah it's going to be tougher uh, in town, in the big city. Yeah, I think when in the, in the first book, when he finally showed up on Wax's doorstep, it was like, Wayne has been waiting for that moment for a long time because he was just at a loss as to what to do with himself. Mm-hmm. I bet that's exactly right. So... He spots a new candelabra of pure gold with a white doily underneath it. Exactly what he needs. Rich people don't make sense at all. That candelabra was probably worth a fortune, and Wax just left it laying around. And so he pulls out a pocket watch, a broken pocket watch. He says he can shake it and hear the pieces rattling around inside. Picks up the candelabra, pockets the doily underneath it, puts the candelabra back, and hangs the pocket watch on it. Seems like a fair trade. That that probably is a fair trade, let's be honest. Yeah, that one's, that one's totally fair. I mean, Didn't I feel he... like they're both equally as good at telling the time. So. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But you can't blow your nose with a watch. Yeah. Well, that's because you're not trying hard enough. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. Oh, you got you there. <laughs> I would work, but I'm sure Wayne could find a way. <laughs> yes, that, that is that is fair. If anyone could do it. <laughs> he blows his nose into the doily. He's like, I've been needing a new handkerchief. Also, like, aren't doilies... Like, it's a lace doily, right? Yep. That, that's, like, that's not going to be nice. <laughs> I wouldn't think. No, also, don't I'm... doilies generally have, like, holes and stuff in them? That's kind of where I'm going with this. Like, yeah. it's not good. <laughs> it, 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 I, I say that it is less satisfactory as, like, a tissue than than it telling time. Like, it's <laughs> not, not fit for purpose. <laughs> Does, does anyone know somebody who uses doilies? Uh, my mother. Mm, okay. We have doilies that have been, like, handed down <laughs> from great, great, great grandparents. And because everyone in my family crochets, so everyone makes doilies. And then all of a sudden, with all the doilies. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Yep. Yeah. At some, at some point, we're going to need a bigger house purely for the doily cupboard. <laughs> Okay, so Wa- Wayne finds Wax and complains that Wax has been working so hard and says, you make it hard to loaf about properly. Makes me look bad, is all. Proper loafing requires company. One man laying around is being idle. Two men laying around is a lunch break. I love that. That's a great Oh, point. yeah. Yep. 100% behind him on that one. <laughs> yeah. There is some sense in that noggin. And Wax has a layout of the ballroom and the deaths and like what weapon killed who basically and so he points out that this basically proves that it was a steel runner four of the most powerful people in the room were killed with the same gun the same gun that also killed the guards outside the safe room so i bet that all four were shot first and so quickly that it sounded like a single loud shot but they were all killed from a different direction so basically yeah only somebody moving super fast around the room could have done this Wax, do, Wax doesn't understand the pattern. Like, they all seem to be in random conversations. I don't know why it was these people. Why four shots from different places? And Wayne points out, well, okay, maybe he... Where were they shooting from? Who was standing where they were shot from? Maybe that's the point. It's like how 
to start a bar fight, you throw a bottle at some fellow, and then you turn to the person next to you and cry out, hey, why'd you throw a bottle at that nice fellow? Russ, he looks big, and now he's coming for you. So that's Wax. exactly what Wayne has done at some point, right? Well, obviously, yeah. <laughs> Wax says, you have, you might have something, and Wayne says, it's not catching. <laughs> so you just recognize this because the killer is making others do his work for him, which is an, an expertise of yours. So... Wayne says, well, what are you going to do? And Wax says, I'm thinking about sending you to the village. And Wayne says, not today. It's the first of the month. And Wax is like, oh, you, don't need, you don't need to go every month. And Wayne says, I do. And Wax is like, okay, well, why haven't you left then? And they have a, a discussion of the things that Wayne always says. <laughs> that Wayne doesn't remember, Wayne always says. <laughs> nope. Greet every morning with a smile. That way I won't know what you're planning to do to it. Or... Until you know it ain't true, treat every, every woman like she has an older brother what is stronger than you are. And Wayne's like, no, not that. Wait, I said that? <laughs> I feel like you're chivalrous, but then what happens when you find out she doesn't have an older brother? You should still treat her the same way. Still be yes. nice. It's true. Yeah, I, I, I guess you make a point. I was only thinking about the last half of that sentence, but it's, it starts with until you know it ain't true. Yeah, okay, good point. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but... Uh, I love- I love it how, like, this conversation, he, he spent the conversation leading up to it. It's like, yeah, I'm a genius, I'm a genius. And then they spout off these things like, wait, I said this? Oh, <laughs> shit, maybe I really am. Uh, I, I need to write these things down. Yeah, you'd have to learn how to write first. Now, that's unfair. I can write. I know four whole letters, and one's not even in my name. Which, he has five different letters in his name, so. He... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I made that observation as well. I was like, which letter in his name does he not know? Which two letters in his name yeah, which does two? he not know? Yeah. <laughs> And what's the letter he does know? Yeah, the one extra one. And finally, we find out that the one he's thinking about today is, if you're going to have to do something awful, stop by Wax's room and trade for some of his rum first. I don't believe you've ever said that. I just did. Okay, okay. So, Wayne, you lied. It's like, if you just said it, then you don't often say it. (laughs) Often starting right now. Hmm. Okay, maybe he maybe he always says it to his hat. Maybe he goes, "All right, hat, we're going out for the day. We must stop by Wax's mm. room and get some rum first. Which is, <laughs> yeah. he does always say it just to Wax. There you go. Why would, would you even hears, say that to Wax? I wonder if he ever hears the the hat talk back. Probably right. He has been come hit on, on the head uh, a lot. <laughs> come on, Benson, let's go. Stop it. That's not my name. <laughs> and Wax is like, I guess I'm gonna have to go to the village then. And Wayne says, sorry, I know you hate that place. You want a piece of advice? You should stop by Wax's room before you go and pinch some of his rum. The rum you just pocketed? Oh, mate, sorry. Tough for you. And then he leaves. Just, oh, gosh. Wayne. Wax is just like, bitch, you're lucky you're adorable. Yeah. <laughs> you're lucky you're useful. But we cut to Marisai, who's uh, wearing a uniform, I guess. It doesn't sound like a very... Uh, nice looking police uniform but man it's just me i mean brown is just kind of an icky color really mm. everyone hating on brown <laughs> i mean i feel like it can look in in good in, in certain circumstances but as a uniform goes like kind of gross and yeah. she's she's picking up a newspaper and uh the newsman says ruin break that tim fashion and his machines talking about them the motor cars driving by so I guess that's that's their version of Henry Ford or whatever is Tim Vashon. So she's looking into the headlines or into the stories about what happened to the governor's brother. And we, in this warnings paper, there was a very small, like, one paragraph on it. Now there is a bit more about uh, Winston was killed in his mansion, perhaps a casualty of constable action against the criminal elements that he was hanging out with. The constables admit no culpability for the deaths. I like this, that they're, they're like, maybe the cops killed him. Just a very like no evidence behind it, but we're gonna we're gonna take a guess and see maybe and publish that. I mean, yeah, a whole bunch of criminals get killed. It seems like a reasonable assumption. Yeah, the suspicious the suspicions about the mysterious circumstances have led to a general outcry. She says the Ellendale Daily was hardly the most reputable news source in the basin, but it did know its market. News stories that people agreed with or were scared by sold the most copies. Yeah, ain't that true? Yep. And as she's walking into the precinct, she notices a bunch of guys loitering, dark jackets of teamsters, hands shoved in pockets, out of work. Too many idle men out of work. That's yeah, that's generally not good for uh, crime crime rates. 
Men who, whose families had worked for three generations in the same job suddenly found themselves unemployed. And with the labor disputes at the steel mills, the governor had been making promises, empty promises mostly, but men losing hope clung to such promises. And she th- she thinks a fire is kindling in the city. You can almost feel the heat coming off the broadsheets. She's worried about where things are going and that Lord Winston might actually do more harm dead than he would have alive, which was saying something. There's really nothing good about this guy, was there? Nope. So we cut to Wax, who's getting out of uh, out of his carriage. The hat and the mist coat made him stand out like a man who'd brought a shotgun to a knife fight. Another great simile. It's just fun stuff. And he sees that everyone else wears very different hats from what he's wearing. And he thinks maybe Wayne was right about that. He never would shut up about the importance of a hat. So it's interesting to me that apparently this was city first because the cobblestones have like been pushed up and out of the way and stuff. So this isn't like here's a nice place and the terrace will live here while the city gets built around them. There was city built here and apparently the terrace have taken it over and the plants are just growing up out of. So that's kind of. Hmm. Yep. This was not a park. This was a forest, uncultivated, unmanicured, fresh, and primal. You couldn't bring a carriage or a motor into the village. Even without the trees, the ground would be too rough and uneven. Harmony had made the basin ferociously fecund. It's great, great words. I love that. Just the way that sounds when you say it. <laughs> Men didn't farm here so much as fight to harvest quickly enough. And like, he's walking in here just strapped. He's got... Vindication and a stereon on either hip, his shotgun in the holster on his thigh, he's got metal inside of him, he's got that aluminum lined hat, he's ready for a fight. Yeah, I can't help but feel, although he's probably dressed this way to displease his uh, grandparents a little bit right? as well. It seems <laughs> intentional, right? Yeah. Because I, I can't imagine he thinks he's actually going to get into a gunfight and kill some of these people in the village, so it has to be just to annoy his grandmother. And so he finds three terrorist men waiting for him as he strolls in, all wearing the robes of brutes, ferrochemists who could increase their strength. One had darker skin. Some of the originators from ancient terrace had been of dark of skin. Wax's own tan probably came from that. So he's Wax is kind of a tan dude, I guess, is what we're learning here. I honestly would have assumed that would just come from being in the desert, but OK. Right. None of the men here had the elongated features seen in ancient paintings. That was a thing of mythology. So that's. I guess an interesting note about how the terrorist people have changed a bit. Mm-hmm. What is it you need, outsider? One of the men said. I want to speak with the Synod. Are you a constable? Of a sort. The terrorists police themselves. We have an agreement, an arrangement. It's like, yeah, I know. I just need to talk to the Synod, or at least Elder Vwafendal. And these guys don't want to let him in, basically. Like, you shouldn't be here. And then a tired voice is like, it's all right, Rizal. And they're like, we tried to send him away, Elder. He has a right to be here. He has as much terrorist blood as you do, more than most. And th- they look over at Wax like, you don't mean? Yes. She says, looking very tired. This is m- he, my grandson. And then we cut back to Wayne, who has finished off the bottle of rum. And he keeps the bottle. It's a good bottle. He should be able to trade it for something. He waves goodbye to Red, the boatman, who let Wayne bum rides in exchange for a story. He spits a coin out of his mouth. And gives it to him, and the guy's like, why is this wet? Were you sucking on this? Alamancers can't push on my coin if it's in my mouth. You're drunk, Wayne. Not nearly drunk enough. That cheapskate wax didn't even have the decency to stock a full bottle. That's ungrateful. He shows that he's at Ellendale University, and it's time for Wayne's three tests. And he's he's getting a little bit, uh, a little foggy, foggy, as he says. He's like, maybe I shouldn't have downed the whole bottle of rum. When he was properly smashed, he could take a punch or two in the face and not even feel it. There was a kind of invincibility to that, a stupid kind, but Wayne wasn't a picky man. <laughs> just, oh, God. That's, that just sums up Wayne to a T. <laughs> right. And here's where he sees the sign etched, the etched letters over the top of the university gates proclaim, wasing the always of wanting of knowing. Deep words. He'd heard them interpreted as the eternal desire of a hungry soul is knowledge, just like Jamie said. When, oh, my God. I'm surprised <laughs> you could read that with only knowing it's four letters. Right? Yeah. That's a good point. I hadn't considered that. I, I, I assumed that it was a joke, that he only knew four letters. But <laughs> Well, unless that's just the story he tells Wax and doesn't reveal that he actually can 
that would be hilarious actually like he's been tricking wax into thinking he couldn't write <laughs> he's yeah he's, he's like right, wax i need you to write this down for me it's like one of these days i'm gonna teach you how to write and he's like oh i'll never get the hang of it and secretly he's just like <laughs> sucker <laughs> but they've got two men guarding the gate he's like oh they're, they're watching out for me this time after the nature of any great hero from the stories he was going to do his best to avoid this particular trial they bricked up the broken part of the wall that he'd used last time, and the tree that he'd climbed the other time had been cut down. He decided to follow another great tradition of heroes facing trials. He went looking for a way to cheat. So he finds Dims, a young man with a bowler hat and a bow tie and the sh- sleeves ripped off his shirt. He was uh, the head of... Is a, is a statement? It, it, it very much reminds me of Badger, except... Uh, no, yeah, nice. Badger from Firefly, yeah. <laughs> Badger and Ham had a little boy. Yeah, yeah, with the shorts, the shirt sleeves. Good point. He was the lead, uh, the head of one of the more important street gangs in the area, but he never stabbed people too badly when he mugged them and was polite with the people he extorted. Practically a model citizen. He's like, hi, Dims. And Dims is like, you a Connor today, Wayne? Nope. Ah, good. And he pulls out a little metal container, which when I first read this, I'm sure is like some sort of drugs. And no, it's gum. <laughs> Wayne's like, what's gum? You chew it, and Wayne chews it and likes the flavor and swallows it. And Tim's is like, "You don't swallow it, Wayne. You just chew it." So, how are things with the co- with you and the cobblers? The cobblers were a rival gang. Dims and his fellows went around with their sleeves torn. The cobblers wore no shoes. Apparently, made perfect sense to the use of the street. Wayne liked to keep an eye on them. They were good lads. He'd been like them once. I like that he's looking out for these like homeless kids in these gangs. As not. Not to the point of trying to reform them or find them homes or anything, but he's like, you know, I keep an eye out for him. He's actually got a good heart. Yeah. His heart's in the right place. He's just not always doing the smart stuff. Uh, boys like this, they could use someone to point them in the right direction. And so he he wants a favor from Dims. Dims like, you bring that money you owe me from cards two weeks back? Rust, Wayne, are you drunk? It ain't even noon yet. I ain't drunk. I'm investigating alternative states of sobriety. The kid says he owes him 20. Wayne distinctly remembers it being five, but he has a 50 for him. And he says, I need to get into the university. The gates are open. Can't go through the front. They know me. Tim nodded. That sort of thing was a common complaint in his world. So somebody wearing Wayne's hat, coat, and dueling canes tries to get it through the front gates of the university a few minutes later. Sees the two men in black and then bolts as the men chase after him. Wayne, on the other hand, strolls in, adjusting his spectacles. Ruffians trying to get into the university. How scandalous. I am shocked that he allowed someone else to wear his hat. Right? That that stood out to me, too. But he's got spectacles now. They're kind of like a hat for smart people. (laughs) (laughs) I was kind of shocked he hadn't tried that before. Yeah, you'd think the disguise would be like right up, uh, right at the top of the list of things that Wayne would be trying. He gets to the girls' dormitory. Looks an awful lot like a prison. The Iron Gate seem to say, stay away, boys, if you value your nether parts. <laughs> and the woman sitting behind the desk, built like an ox with a face to match, her hair even curled like horns. She was a fixture of the university, or so Wayne had been told. Perhaps she'd come with the chandeliers and sofas. How'd you get past campus security? I tossed them a ball. Most towns love having something to chase. <laughs> yeah, he kind of did in a way. <laughs> this lady loves to consider herself part of Ellendale's upper society. And she kind of was in the same way the blocks of granite that made up the steps to the governor's mansion were part of the civic government. <laughs> I uh, thought I told you. <laughs> if, 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 every line is a punchline. It's great. It is. It's so true. Like every Wayne moment is. Uh, Wayne, nothing but zingers. Well, I thought I told you not to come back. I thought I ignored you. Are you drunk? Now, if I were drunk, you wouldn't look nearly so ugly. I can't believe your audacity. Really? Because I'm sure I've been this audacious before. Every month, in fact. So it seems a right believable thing for me to do. It's just every, yes, every line is a joke. And she says she's not going to let him in. And he's like, look, I just want to check on her. And she says, she's fine. He's like, I have money to give her. And she says, well, you can leave it here. You distressed the girl, miscreant. I didn't want to have to do this. And to his surprise, she cracked her knuckles. And she's like, oh, please try to start some shit here. I kind of like this lady. Yeah. She's doing her job for the most part until she takes a bribe. Oh, until she's so easily bored. Yeah. The bribe part is where it's kind of. 
One ticket admitting two people to the governor's spring dinner and policy speech occurring during a party at Lady Zobel's penthouse tonight. The ticket has no specific names. Anyone who has it can get in. Interesting name, Zobel. Right? Just like with the capital B with in the, capital the middle B. of the word. It's just like, is that meant to invoke a Kandra-ish name? Right? Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> Who'd you steal that from? Please, it came delivered to my house. Which was true. It was for Wax and Steris, and he lives there, so. Wax adopted him. Yeah, well, yeah. basically. <laughs> Steris is like, oh, I didn't know you had kids. Well, yeah. <laughs> Since he was like 16, or maybe a little younger, we know. Yeah. Wayne figured that Wax would be happy not to have to go to the blasted party anyway. Besides, Wayne had left a real nice-looking leaf he'd found in exchange. Rusting beautiful, that leaf was. <sighs> oh, gosh. Yeah, okay. And she's like, okay, I guess I can let you in one last time. I'm not supposed to let unrelated men into the visiting room. And he's like, I'm practically family. They made a big fuss about keeping young women and young men separated here, which Wayne found odd. With all these smart people around, wouldn't one of them had realized what boys and girls were supposed to do together? I think that's Your per- right. <laughs> very unique perspective on Wayne. So, yes, we meet Alriandre. Which uh, I hadn't, I mean, ob- the Alrian Al- part is obvious. I hadn't put together that it's also kind of Beldry until you said that. Yeah, I mean, it could be nothing, but I was just like, oh, yeah, w- maybe. I wonder if Alrian just became like a very well-known figure after this and her name became popular, like after the end of the books. Mm-hmm. Well, what was it the last book that said Breeze was the counselor of kings yeah. or something? Counselor to the gods. And Alrian was his wife and she had... She was always telling the story that Vin and she were best buddies, so. <laughs> and maybe she has a nickname like that, too. God's BFF. <laughs> and Alriandri has brought some backup. Two other young ladies about her age, just shy of 20. Smart girl, Wayne thought, proud. Madam Penfor says you're drunk, Alriandri said, remaining in the doorway. And, like, he taps his healing to burn away the alcohol for some reason, his body thought alcohol was poison, which showed that a fellow couldn't always trust his own body. But today he didn't complain. Wayne's like, nah, I was just messing with her. I brought this month's money. And he puts an envelope out. And one of the girls is like, is that really him? They say he rides with Dawn Shot of the Roughs. It's him. I don't want your money. Your mama told me to bring it to you. You don't need to bring it in person. I do. How are your studies? Are they treating you well here? Is there anything you need? And she pulls out a locket which opens up to show a picture of a man with a wide mustache and a twinkle in his eye with a long, friendly face and thinning hair, her father. And she says, tell me what you did. And he doesn't want to, but he has to. It's like, I killed your daddy. I mugged him in an alley for his pocketbook. I shot a better man than me. And because of that, I don't deserve to be alive. You know, you aren't forgiven. I know, you know, you never will be forgiven. I know. Then I'll take your blood money. If you care to know, my studies go well. I'm thinking of taking up the law. And then she tells him to get out, and he does. It's just, it's very, it's very sad. I get his reasoning for for going back every month, and it's, he's trying to do the right thing the best that he can, given the the circumstances. But gosh, that would be hard to do. Yeah. Like hard for, I guess hard for both of them, but it would be really easy to go, yeah, I'm walking away, but that obligation in him like he really is a good guy and he does feel absolutely terrible and that was such a a turning point in his life too so yeah that just to to put you through that every month as well just that's awful i mean we have the benefit of knowing that wayne is not a bad guy she doesn't as far as she's concerned he killed her dad and that's that so like i get the hostility but Just not nice for any of them. Also, knowing that he was going to turn up every month and that you had to go through that every month as well. Like, that's yeah. also a bit shit. Yeah, I, I can't imagine. I mean, like you said, we we can understand Wayne's perspective and that he feels this responsibility and that oh, the fact that it's hard for him is all the more reason why he's like, I have to do it. Like, this, I deserve this it's pain my- that I have to go through. Yeah. yeah. But it's... From her perspective, it, like having to be confronted face to face with the man who killed your father once a month, like I, I can't imagine having to go through that on her end. No. Just the fact that the thing that got me about this scene is the fact that in the lead up to this, what like we were saying, Wayne was on fire, zingers and jokes and everything all around. As soon as she came into the room, 
we've never seen him that serious and deadpan mm. before. Like he is yeah. just completely 100%. Hi, how are you? Are you okay? Here's your money. Like absolutely no bullshit, no trades, no jokes, no zingers. Yeah. Yeah. When he stops joking, I really conveys the seriousness of the moment. Yeah. No, very, very well written. Yeah. I find it interesting that apparently her mom was like, instead of sending us the money every month, take it to my daughter at the university. So maybe he's paying her way through university for all we know. I mean, probably. I don't remember if we know how many kids that guy had. Like uh, he might end up paying for a bunch of kids going through college. And maybe they said it was three. That sounds right to me. Maybe three is just such a normal number for that sort of thing that it, it seems right. But I agree that the kind of is what I was thinking. Yeah. So cut back to wax. Stepping into the village is like stepping backwards in time hundreds of years. The air smells of old leather and furs. and uh, There shouldn't have been a thatched log hut in the middle of Elendel, and yet there was. The enormous fire pit in the middle would never be needed in Elendel's mild weather. But today, there's a small fire with a kettle of hot water for tea on it. And they got paintings of frozen rain and wind, tiny figures on s- slopes. All fragments of mythology, old terrace, the land of ice and snow, the white furred beasts and spirits that haunted frozen storms. It's very dramatic. Mm -hmm. In the early days following the Catacendry, refugees from terrace had written down memories of their homeland as no keepers had remained. So I guess Sazed really was the last keeper. That's sad. Right? But of course, he also wrote down in books all the stuff that was in his metal mines. So hopefully they didn't lose too much. Mm. And I like that, uh, like, some of the old Terrace people, some said that old Terrace, the land, waited for these people hidden somewhere in this new world of Harmony's design. And for them, it's like, in their mythology, it's like this paradise, despite the fact that it was like this frozen, really hard to live in land. It's like the legendary old Terrace, our, our, our home, is out there somewhere, maybe. His grandmother says, did you remove your guns at least this time before entering the village? I did not. So insolent. During your long absence, I often wondered if the roughs might temper you. They made me more stubborn is all. A land of heat and death. Everything about you stinks of death, Asinthu. And she says, and he's Wax says, that's not what my father named me. And she says, your father didn't have the right. So I guess maybe in terrorist culture, the mom gets to name the kid. I don't know. Or maybe just because... Um, the father wasn't a terraceman. He just didn't have the right. That yeah, could be it, too, yeah. A Synthu is kind of a cool name. I, I speed read it to start with, then completely missed what they said and thought, did she just call him Andrew? <laughs> that would be funny if, like, terrace names were, like, by our standards, normal names, and it was all the other people who had these weird waxillium <laughs> type names. Yeah. Well, and she's just like, I would tell you, I would demand you remove your weapons, but it's, it'd be pointless with you. You could kill someone with a coin or a button or this pot. And here's where she, she says, neither power is evil. It's the mixing that is dangerous. Your nature is not your fault, but I cannot help but see it as a, as a sign. Another tyrant in our future. Too powerful. It leads to death. Boy, so, you are not ready to hear about Marsh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, really, she she was she's almost right. We saw m- what Miles did with his power. He was too powerful for everyone else's good, basically. Yeah. And so he's he's this is bringing back memories. A young man who'd never been able to decide what he was, alamancer or fairy chemist, city lord or humble terraceman. And he says, a steel runner slaughtered people in the fourth octant last night, grandmother. And I know you track everyone in the city with ferrochemical blood. I need names. And she says, you've only visited the village three times since you came home, back to the city. Nearly two years, and you've only made time for your grandmother twice before today. And he's like, well, can you blame me, given how these meetings go? I know how you feel about me. There's no point in torturing either of us. And she's trying to tell him that that was a long time ago. You, you cling to images of me from two decades ago. People change, even someone like me, though not one such and as she you. she then goes on to prove that she has yeah. She says, oh, I, like, even I can change and goes on to prove that she hasn't at all. Right. Like, yeah, she basically just starts up the same old arguments again. He's saying, like, you still don't know who you are. He's like, look, I'm not going to start wearing terrace robes and quoting proverbs at people. And she says, yeah, you're going to shoot them instead. So apparently he lived in the village for one year. That had been all his father would was willing to agree to. Uncle Edward had wanted 
both him and his sister to stay away from the place. Before his cousin had been born, Uncle Edward didn't have any children, so he appropriated his brother's children and tried to raise them since they were going to be the heirs to the house. <laughs> Sounds like too many parents in this situation. You've already got a noble and a terrace <laughs> battling it out over who's going <laughs> to uh, influence their child, and then you've got the uncle in there too. They're like my children, it's fine. <laughs> He doesn't really talk about his mom here, so I don't know if she was out of the picture. It says that he, basically his grandmother and his uncle were fighting over him. Pretty much. Wax had been forbidden allomancy during his days in the village, but had learned something greater, that criminals existed even among the idyllic terrace. So that sounds like there's a story there. People walk, like you just imagine these terrace guys walking around with shirts that say Rorschach was right. <laughs> oh, jeez. Wow. The- it doesn't sound like they're big fans of Rorschach from what his grandmother's saying, but yeah, there's all sorts of different personalities. Who knows? Yeah, I, I yeah, I assume that like there there might be some like this this far removed from Rorschach's rule, uh, there might be some people who like yeah like don't don't see the horrors in what he did, and and then you got that bloody book that of um of says and spooks that you know presumably got around where they say Rorschach ha- did have some of the right ideas and went about in the wrong way, so it's easy for people to extrapolate that until maybe Rorschach was right. Right. Well, we know the Sliverism is a religion out there and that uh, there's even a town called Rorschachin or something. So, yeah, it's entirely possible. Yeah. There are fans. Yeah. She I'm says... I'm going to go on record and say I, I don't condone that line of thinking, <laughs> but it's just possible for characters in the book. Let's just get that out of the way. Yeah, no. We all know Rorschach was an asshole before he ever even got any sort of uh, super... I mean, I guess he was a, a ferro chemist already, but... Before he took the power of the wall of ascension, he was already an asshole, so. Yeah. As, as much as Hero Vay just tried to say, oh, you know, he wasn't that bad. Y- yes, he was. I mean, maybe he was trying to save the world in his own way, uh, so you can give him that. But it's, you know, you, you don't have to be a nice guy to be trying to save the world. You can be a dick also, so. <laughs> He's very much the, uh, I could save everyone by killing most of them. Modern yeah. problems require modern solutions. <laughs> <laughs> by making myself God Emperor and crushing all who defy me beneath my boot heel. And his grandmother says, you came looking for a ferrochemist killer. You need only look in the mirror, child. If a man is what he does, think of what you've done. That's harsh. Like, geez, grandma. And then you wonder why I don't come to visit. Yeah, seriously. Yeah, the, ner- the nerve of this woman. I've never killed a man who didn't deserve it. Can you be absolutely certain of that? And he's like, oh, reasonably. If I've made mistakes, I'll pay for them someday. But you won't distract me. Fighting is not against the terrorist way, even Harmony killed. He slew beasts and monsters only, never our own. I mean, if you count Rorschach, uh, I guess he didn't kill Rorschach. He handed Vin the spear that she used to stab him. And he's and Wax is finally done with her shit, basically. He's like, look, I'm going to hunt down a murderer. That's what I'm doing. If I have to do it without your help and he kills again before I can stop him, then you're going to be partly to blame and see how well you sleep at night with that. And she's like, are you going to kill him? Would, will you shoot for the chest when you could aim for the leg? People die around you. Don't deny it. And he's like, I'm not denying it. A man should never pull the trigger unless he's willing to kill. And if the other fellow is armed, I'm going to aim for the chest. That way, when people die, do die around me, it's the right ones. And finally, she says, the one you're looking for is named Idashwi, and she is not a man. Steel runner? Yes, but she's not a killer. And he says, but, and she says, the, she's the only steel runner I know who could possibly be involved in something like this. She vanished a month ago after acting very erratically. Claimed that she was being visited by the spirit of her dead brother. Kandra. Hmm, right? That is, yeah, that's what it sounds like. I dash we is how you pronounce that, he says. The terrorist language had once been dead, but Harmony's records included it, and many terrorists now learn to speak it in their youth. Well, that's nice. Although, I guess really, he told us back in the very first book that like the what was spoken in the Final Empire was like an offshoot of the or old terrorist language. So it wasn't really dead dead. It was actually kind of the primary language in a way. Yeah, that's right. And uh, he's like, I know that name. And she's like, you did know her long ago. You were with her that night, actually, before. Ah, yes. He remembers. I didn't even know she was a ferrochemist. You don't even have the decency to look ashamed. I'm not. Hate me if you must, grandmother, but coming to live with you changed my life just as you always promised it would. I'm not going to be ashamed the transformation wasn't the one you expected. And she asks him, she's not, she's not a killer. Try to bring her back. She's confused. And he says, they all are. And then drops a coin and launches himself into the air. And a final way to piss off his grandmother. Yep. 
Just throw some alamancy in there. Just rub it right in her face. Peace. <laughs> oh, gosh. We cut back to Marisai, who's at the police station now. She'd grown up reading stories of the of the roughs, of lawmen and villains, and dreaming of six guns and stagecoaches. Even taken up horseback riding and rifle shooting. So she was illegitimate, but her father had left her and her mother a generous stipend and set them up in a fine home. Well, that's I get, nice of you, I guess. With that kind of promise and with her mother's determination that Marisai should enter society and prove herself to her father, one did not choose a profession such so lowly as that of constable. Yet here she was. And I love that uh, in her spare time, she, you know, reads about crimes and stuff better than reading the politely angry letters from her mother, which lay underneath. So her mom's not happy uh, that uh, with the path that she has chosen, the lowly constable job. And she's she's comparing the, the police station to the law, law office that she was in for a while. I think you should probably still be there if she hadn't met Wax. She'd have done as her mother wanted, seeking validation through her child. Proof, perhaps, that she could have married Lord Harms if it had been in the cards, despite her low birth. She loved her mother, but the woman simply had too much time on her hands. I don't want to meet Mar- Marisai's mom now. She sounds like an interesting character. I'm sure she'll show up at some point. And so she gets some tea and goes to meet up with uh, Aradel. He did tend to micromanage, but at least he was earnest. And like he's like, hey, where'd you get that tea, Combs? She says, yeah, you want me to have someone fetch you some? And he's like, no, no, I can do it. And he looks at the broadsheet. And he was he says he was hoping that they would spin the, the, the stuff against the constables. And she's like, what? He's like, yeah, people love hating the cops. We're, we can be like a lightning rod for it. Better us than the governor. I mean, point. And, I hadn't really thought about it that way. Yeah, right. And she has uh, some issues with the governor. She is pretty sure the governor is corrupt. Too many coincidences, too many small oddities in his policy decisions. But she just can't quite prove it, and he basically tells her to keep her mouth shut unless she can. Feel free to ask the questions in your own head and not out loud. And this is where, uh, as Reddy scowls at her, she's like, someday I'm going to figure out why that man hates me. And Erdell's like, oh, oh, you stole his job. Wait, what? Well, let me save you the trouble. I can tell you why he hates you. Yeah. <laughs> I know oh. why you, he's, he's sad. <laughs> uh, yep. There you go. And so, yeah, he ready was going to become the assistant until Aradell decided to hire Marisai instead. And she's like, why him? Like, he's already a senior field constable. He, and Ar- he was going to he was going to be my assistant. You could say he was ready. <laughs> oh, uh, 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 no. uh. You, you, nope. you, you can tell Dak is a dad now. He's got the dad <laughs> jokes. Um, got to perfect this shit. Yeah, he needs practice. <laughs> Does it, though? I feel like as soon as you become a dad, it just... Just automatically. <laughs> it's got to be sleep yeah. deprivation, I think. Oh, yeah, that, that probably does it. You're right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Everyone has this idea that in order to move up, you need to spend more time in the office and less on the street. And Aradel thinks that's stupid. I want the assistant position for nurturing someone fresh who shows promise rather than letting some practiced constable gather moss, which makes terrific sense. And instantly explains to Marisai why not just Reddy, but most people here seem to not like her. Because everyone thinks she stole a job that should have been Reddy's instead. And she's like, Especially like, Reddy wanted to change careers a little bit. That's a bit rough. It's like, no, 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 you're better where you are. But I want to go. I want to do something else. I want to stand my still with it. It sounds like he wanted to get promoted, so... Uh, it, it, if Aaron, if Aradel is deciding on promotions also, then he's probably looking at it a different way than these other ones, where it's like he wants somebody good in the field to get promoted. Yeah, fair enough. But I, I like she takes a moment. It's like, wait, you think I show promise? He's like, yeah. Why else would I have hired you? A, a compliment? <laughs> the first time ever. Oh, my gosh. That's not fair. Wax complimented her several times last book. Again, chip, shoulder. Yeah. Yeah, she's also got issues with Wax. But he says, I don't care about your grades or what those zinc tongues in the solicitor's office thought of you. The words oh, you wrote about changing. Yeah, right. The words you wrote about changing the city. Those made sense. And that impressed me. And she's like, oh, my gosh, thanks for the praise. And he's like, no, I'm not flattering you. It's just a fact. <laughs> and she, he wants her to. It's like the governor's going to make a speech. I want you to go out there and report back to me what he says, but espe- especially how the crowd reacts to him. And she says, yes, sir. And he goes on. Those were the two chapters we read, and you guys will notice, uh, and we'll talk about it next time, that there's some more broadsheet stories coming up right after this. 
And hopefully in your version also, but in my version, it's no longer just the broadsheet. The picture of the broadsheet is followed up by the actual text written out, so you don't have to like squint and try to figure out what it's saying. Oh, cool. Uh, no, we do not have that. You don't have that? Is that just the electronic version? That's that sucks. Yeah, we just got the broadsheet and then it goes straight to chapter six. Okay. Well, that's Ooh, old children love Sunni pups. Yeah, we can talk about that next time. But I, I love <laughs> the Sunni pups; they're awesome. Okay, so now that we're we, we're getting kind of into the meat of what's going on. We've got a suspect for our murders and a line potentially leading back to suit somewhere in here. What do you guys think is going to happen? Let's do some predicaments. I mean, you know, I, I went pretty out there with my predictions last time. I don't have a huge amount other than I, I do think we're, we're leading towards uh, Mr. Suit and his involvement how how that involves a ferric chemist. I mean, our ferric chemist has gone missing, so maybe is he taking ferric chemists as well as elements? We still don't know. Mm. And then, you know, like maybe that's a thing. I don't know if there's other ferric chemists missing, but, yeah, I mean, Mr. Suit wasn't there. I don't think it's going to take them long to, long to figure out that he should have been at the – auction gathering um and wax is already kind of suspect on that anyway but i think he's suspect on that for everything really right. yeah I, I don't know specifically where we're going to go with that crime yet i hope we see a bit more of the terrace people i think i hope we get a bit more involved in that in this book you know we we kind of followed that formula in the first trilogy you know, we had the Alamancers, then we had the Ferrochemists, and then we had Hemology at the end. Oh, yeah. Mar- yeah, so, so maybe we get a bit more of that. I also hope we get a bit more of Marsh's book soon as well, a few few more little tidbits. I was sort of hoping that that would be kind of come, uh, kind of become this, uh, this series' epigraphs, mm. maybe piecing bits of another puzzle together and, and see how that all worked together. But in terms of where we're going – like right now, I'm I'm not really sure yet. I think it's still a bit early. Okay. Yeah, I guess we don't really. I, I mean, maybe the the uh, broadsheet pages count kind of like the epigraphs. Even they're not at the beginning of every chapter, but yeah, it's, we've gotten a very tiny tease of that book so far, and uh, not not much uh, like meat from that. So that's it. Ready for a little, just a little bit more. Mm-hmm. And again, yeah, curious as to you know, can can we uh, unravel who's actually writing it and would that give us any insight into the mode obviously it's got something to do like marsh has found it important that wax reads it and he obviously knows what wax is up to so it's it's got to tie back in somehow and there's definitely the interest in the hemology there as well you've got grandma's fears of having alamantian and ferrochemy in the same bloodlines mm-hmm. You know, is there the same fear around? Well, I mean, yeah. If if you had misborn powers and you had all of the ferrochemical abilities as well, that's pretty terrifying. Is someone trying to put together another superpowered being? Is that even possible? You know, has Says kind of gone? Look, you know what? No more misborn. It's just diluted now. But if hemology still exists, there's no reason you couldn't. If you found all of the mistings and the fairings put them together yeah it's true scary (laughs) (laughs) okay so i've got a couple and two of them like are sort of actually in direct conflict with each other but yeah we'll figure that out so start with i think the obvious one to make and that is um i i shan we i am i pronouncing that right i i yeah i think that i shan we yeah i I shan we uh she so she was the girl at the auction that Winston was suspicious of. Mm. Um, I, th- I, th- I, oh, I remember when I'd forgotten about her. Yeah. I just, I just, like, it seemed like a lot of focus on that character that we never actually found out about. So I feel like that had to be there for a reason. So I think, yeah, that was probably her. And that makes me think cause she was hanging off Dowser's arm. I think Dowser was actually already dead. And, and so he, and so the Dowser we saw was actually the Kandra that was impersonating Aishanwi's dead brother. And so they so they were working in tandem. She 
uh, got everything set up. And then he was able to go around, do some quick stabbing and stuff. And then as everything was going on, uh, they killed Flog. The, um, the Kanja very quickly took Flog's bones, got down to the bunker to open the door and kill Winston. And then Ashan was able to run down, spin around and sh- and pop the guards in the back of the head. Mm. Okay. So I think that's I think that's how that all went down. Um, time will tell. But yeah, just I'm st- I am leaning as hard as I can to this Kanja thing. So I mean, it's probably going to be more volcanoes, but whatever. I, I, I think it's I think it's, pl- I think it's plausible. And uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was Flog who actually killed Winston, and then Ashanwi was just getting him out by taking out the guards. So that's theory number. That's theory number one. Theory number two, which is in conflict, like most of it sort of works in tandem, except Grandma V is le- is lied about who Ashanwi really is, and it's actually Wax's sister who is this who is the steel runner, and she and she works with Mister Suit. Oh, okay. And so, like, like everything else with the candor and everything, that's that all still stands. But uh, yeah, I think Wax's sister might possibly have turned to Edwan's side and is now working with him. And he's and he's you know finally got an heir. Ooh. Since Wax, Wax, is, Wax is against him, and um, uh, was it Hinston is dead? Right. Yeah. Is that his name? I think so. That sounds right. Yeah. So yeah, either I I don't I couldn't decide which of those fit more. I don't know if yeah, Grandma V is just like outright lying to lying to Wax, which could be possible, but it might be a bit too much of a reach. So if if she's telling the truth, I, it was I Shan Wee. If um if she wasn't, it was Wax's sister, whose name I forget. Wax <laughs> asked about her in the epilogue. Telson. Yep, he asked about her. He's like, uh, where's Telson? And his uncle says your sister is safe. Okay, Telson. I remember that. So yeah, that's those two. That so that's trying to. Sorry. So I was gonna say you could be onto something there because. Wax has two names. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, if like if I like I Shan, we could actually be her terrace name. And when Wax is asking about her, like uh, like Grandma V just points out another completely unrelated terrace girl, so that Wax is just hunting the wrong person. Maybe that's her way of mm-hmm. like trying to keep Wax from killing his sister or harming his sister or just harming anyone because he won't find a steel runner with that description. Mm-hmm. So oh, yeah. yeah, I like They're that. Both- they're both plausible, so we'll have to see how we go there. But yeah, so that's that too. That's that's figuring out stuff that's already happened. As for a prediction for something that's actually in the future, the fact that Ori Endry mentions she might study law stuck out to me. That makes me think that that's that's probably out of trying to seek vengeance, some sort of legal retribution over Wayne. But it made me think, wouldn't it be fascinating if she turns up later down the line? She's like an apprentice lawman who get like um who marisai has to take under her wing and like they both are working together completely oblivious with um that that they're both that they both know wayne in completely different things and they become really close friends like in a mentor mentee relationship Ooh. until until wayne enters the picture and they all of a sudden they realize oh fuck like, i think that would just be a really interesting spanner in the works yeah um and it might it might finally force all Andrew to, to like to you know regard Wayne with outright hatred or some other emotion. Uh, and it, yeah, I, th- I think that would just be a really interesting wrinkle in everyone's relationship with each other. Yeah, I agree. That would be interesting. I mean, Marisai knows the story because that's how we found it out when he told her. So, but, sh- but she doesn't necessarily know that Ori Andrew is the girl is like, is the child of the same right. man. Yeah. yeah. Like, like Ori just goes, Oh yeah. You know, my dad was killed by some, by some guy out in the roughs and it sucked. And Marisa is like, yeah, well, you know, that happens to a lot of people and doesn't put two and two together. Right. So, yeah, there's that, there's all sorts of interesting possibilities to that. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like we're not we're not done with her. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I agree. It seems like there's she she throws that little thing out at the end. It makes it seem like that uh, there's more there's going to be more to this. OK. Interesting. In- interesting stuff. <laughs> interesting, if true. <laughs> Okay, so for next time, people, we are doing chapters six and seven. So two more chapters. In the meantime, let's do the other emails that we've received because there are uh, there is a few. The first one is from someone we've heard from before. It says, I've emailed a few times, but I have changed my name to Valence. Valence, Valence. You can refer to me by that or by the name guy. 
So you guys remember like J. Jonah Jameson? Change, oh, change their name oh. now to Valence. So I, is that to get like, away from that association? No, I don't think so because it says you can call you can call me the name guy if you want, but I just appreciate you not using that other name again. So I'm like, okay, happy 100th episode, and then 102 when this comes out? Question mark. Which yeah, that's pretty much right. Um, I haven't been listening from the beginning, but pretty early on, like June, so episode seven, I think it's been a long few years. But you guys have been a welcome and surprisingly consistent vacation. While I never listened to your baby breaks, I am usually eager for every episode, especially because you're taking a reasonable path through the Cosmere rather than throwing people into Stormlight Archive like everyone else. Yeah, (laughs) people like to hit Stormlight Archive early because it really is very cool and epic, but we'll, we'll get there. I know everyone says it, but I adore your different takes. One of the guys is really burning Adium for this recent book. I learned your names, but I still can't tell Joe and Dak that. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, I can't wait for you be, to be in guessing wildly as we approach more Cosmere connected books, especially some of the secret projects. As you get started with Shadows of Self, I can't wait to see what you come up with. It's, in my opinion, the weakest Wax and Wayne book, but I expect Jamie will like it a lot, and I hope the rest of you enjoy it. Can't wait for another two years. PPS, I second the baby being adorable in the background. <laughs> oh, thanks. I think it's an interesting take. I, a lot of people I've heard say that they feel Alloy of Law is like the weakest one in this second set. Uh, I I don't think I've ever heard anyone say before they thought that uh, Shadows of Self was the weakest. So that's interesting. I mean, every, every book's going to have the people who prefer it and whatnot. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean how, many, how many people have said, like, despite, I think all of us agree that we all thought Well of Ascension was the weakest of the Mistborn trilogy. And we've heard some people say it's their favorite. So, yep. you know, it takes yeah. their own. Yeah. But I guess if you were really into like a political thriller or something, then maybe that would be your your thing. Right. Oh, yeah. Totally fair. Uh, And then they sent a second email. PPS, forgot to add this in my previous email. Great job picking up on Steris being autistic. It took me way too long to get that, and I'm autistic too. So also, thanks for handling it tastefully. I did try as much as I could there. (laughs) Yep. We were trying to not horribly offend anyone. That's generally my approach is uh, try not to horribly offend too many people. Yeah. Like I, I am conscious that I just blather on about random shit all the time, and sometimes my mouth gets away from me, and I might say the wrong thing and by accident. And if I ever do that, I am genuinely sorry. I do not mean to offend, but mm. like, I'm glad that I seem to have avoided that that time. <laughs> okay, so this next one is from Nelson Mandela on Discord. Uh, <laughs> Interesting name choice. Yeah. Hello, Misting Crew, DJ, D, N, okay, so this is spelled D-E-N dash E-N-N dash J-A-Y, DJ, D-N-J, the (laughs) Opossum Hunters, Proud Parents, Final Fantasy Fanatics, and all other applicable joke monikers. (laughs) It was called... Say, man, just covering all bases there. Yeah, seriously. It was called for in the 99th episode, this is written a week after procrastinating, for emails that may just hold a little history of how the podcast has affected and stayed with its listeners. I was not part of the very first downloads of that April so long ago, but I followed once data posted it in a, to a Sanderson adjacent subreddit. Very glad that I have, I have a significant other who used to be a reader, but she really will not tackle the whole door stopper of books. I have given her Psh, only made it to white Knight in the Dresden files before she petered off. She at least got to book four, where everything really kicks off and the fae get involved. It's fair that entry six is a weak one. Uh, White Knight is the ninth. Yeah, so White Knight is nine. I was wondering. Yeah, that's it. I was, um, unless you mean Blood Rides, but even so, that's number six. That's still a decent crack. That, yeah, number six is making it a decent way. Uh, I know a lot of people aren't huge fans of number six, given the like uh, porn storyline that is happening there, uh, especially with like the the... The, the very popular and not unjustified opinion that uh, the depiction of women is not always the best in those books uh, because it's from Harry's perspective and it's got this whole pulp thing going on. But uh, so I, I get why people have some issues with book six and why somebody might stop there. But yeah, fair. I think my wife actually made it to it was either seven or nine. I forget which one before uh, she got off of those also. So I, I feel the pain. Um <laughs> He's then okay. Sorry, back to what he was saying. But we also have taken a year and a half, if not longer, to get to the third gentleman bastard novel while reading aloud to her. So having someone to discuss with is is a luxury to me. 
Warbreaker is my next plan for Read Aloud, my sincere favorite Sanderson novel, and likely the best standalone slash intro to the Cosmere. Q Flame War. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we, we can't judge. Nope, not yet. You can't. It's true. Uh, yeah. I like the Gentleman Bastards books, so uh, I think it's cool to hear that you guys are do uh, the, that you and your significant other have done that too, because uh, those are some of my favorites. Uh, sorry, goes on to say I'm I've sent emails periodically for a while, especially at the beginning of the podcast. It's a very small claim to fame, but I was the reason that Data had to add Sander Lanch with an E for a while after I goofed up. <laughs> I would listen. To, yeah, <laughs> right. I would listen to the Mistborn books while working at a job site alone, either while on a forklift or while bending wire into magnetic fridge clips. So having this discussion has always been appreciated and engaging. I've listened to on jogs regularly and now while working out at the gym. So I get to look forward to the predicaments while walking city streets, getting my brain running in these cold months. That's nice. Uh, I appreciate that the Sander Lanch is the first podcast to be released for me each week. And I love looking forward to it. A great topic and a great thought provoking conversation to kick off the world to. I've also been on the Discord for a good long while, which is a fun community, helped me find a better podcatcher, and I've tried to back up Storm Harbinger with his Welk greetings to new faces. Yes, another one of the people on the Discord. Uh, I I think what the crew is missing out the most there are Data's endless plethora of welcome GIFs. It's honestly incredible how quick to the draw he is and how applicable and unique they are. Yeah, I try to use a, a different welcome GIF when different people showed up. Nice. That's cute. <sighs> So thanks all for what you do to make this podcast. I hope you all enjoy it and get value from just recording it, reading these stories, and interacting across the globe with each other each week. You bring us lots of thoughts and joy, so thank you, Data, for having the idea and acting on it. Congrats on the Patreon release, getting shard tears already, and I'm sure folks are going to enjoy your reactions when the secret projects release. Thank you even more to Joe for dealing with your book-focused brother so often and for bringing a fresh and critical view to the books. You changed my mind on Spook, not nearly as, for, as far as you... <laughs> But I hadn't questioned him since I drove through these books fast. High Imperial is a hilarious joke, though. <laughs> oh, my God. Fitting that uh, we read this today. Right. Uh, <sighs> and mostly, lastly, to Dak and Jamie. Wow, your parents. And that's incredible. Your personalities are so fun and your predicaments are the most wild and most crazily right. Honestly, how, though? You both bewilder me. Thank you, our Oceanic pals, for joining in on all of this. You add so much to the show. Oh, that's Thanks, very man. sweet. Thank you. Uh, and then the last bit is the last thing I have to say is to support data in direct opposition to Joe. And by data, I mean the data, the stats part of the show are a delight to me. And I love when they're brought up what insights <laughs> you get into the world from them. I really think they're a fun way to recap the progress of the podcast. Every book or major part is complete. So we, the people demand the data data, ignore the protesting of your co-host and younger brother. That's what you're supposed to do anyway. Ha ha. Well, so I hope that's that why a... you saved this e email for when Joe wasn't here. Uh, <laughs> no, actually, I'd forgotten. This, this one's a longer one, so I'd forgotten the Joe focus at the end. I was just quickly scanning for ones that were specific to Joe that, in, the, in yesterday's episode. Well, I hope that was fun to read. And as always, Dinosaur Erotica Forever. Colo? Uh, that, that's where you lost us, man. <laughs> <laughs> that was a great email otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Thank you, uh, Nelson Mandela. Glad to know that uh, the show's popular with the uh, with dead people. Wait, is Nelson Mandela dead? Hold on. I yes, think? 2013. Yeah. Okay. I was about to say he'd be really old if he wasn't by now. Yeah. Very. Uh, last one is from Jordan. And Jordan says, first, I'm catching up on the previous episode, so although I've written in a few times before, I didn't start listening from one of your first Reddit posts. I, oh, I did start listening from one of your first Reddit, first Reddit posts, I think. So I've been following since episode two or three, and I love the stuff. Pause to listen to End of Alloy of Law episode. Okay, I'm two-thirds of the way through the episode, and it's enough. All hail King Dak. I'm so happy to see him nail theory after theory after his previous memorable misses. Congratulations, <laughs> Stack. You've leveled up in Brandon Sanders. Yay. You definitely were on point for Alloy of Law. Yep. Okay, yeah, those were weird. Really nice. <laughs> you weird. Uh, you're like, I w we came up on the Discord the other day. I was like, I think everyone's had like at least the one book where they're just like firing on all cylinders and getting stuff right. So that's nice. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone gets a turn. And then there's some books where just nobody's right. And uh, that's the most fun of all. <laughs> 
those were our emails. Thank you, everyone, for emailing. I love them. They're very entertaining. If anyone would like to email us, the address is thesanderlanch at gmail.com with an E at the end. I mean, I guess really there's more than one E in that, um, but there's an E at the end. So, yes. <laughs> Find us on Instagram and our Discord channel. Find us on Patreon, all sorts of places. Wherever good times are had. On the boat. Wherever good <laughs> times are had. Yeah. Anyway. Joe should be back for the next one. And so remember that is going to be chapters six and seven. Another couple of uh, decent length chapters. Neither of them as long as chapter five was. Five was real long. That may have actually been the longest chapter in this book. It was quite lengthy. And there's yeah. so much like happened. Like so much happened. Yeah. Well, it's like you split the party and you're constantly coming back and shifting between them. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like each of them got like two sections of their yeah, perspective. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Like that. they each had an adventure that felt like it could have been its own chapter, really. Mm. But yeah, I like that we got lots of stuff to go through in the episode. So yeah, music by Miracle of Sound. We are now twenty five percent. We're a fourth of the way through the book already. Well, yeah, I don't believe yeah. such a thing. It almost feels like it's going faster than the last one, even at this point. Well, I mean, I guess that's just because we did two days in a row. Yeah, that's probably it. Well, and, and how many, we how many how many episodes is this one gonna be? Uh, I have it mapped out for eleven episodes. Okay. okay. So a couple longer than the previous one, but uh, not too much longer. And then the next book is like 12 episodes. So they're all kind of they're all a bit short. Yep, comparatively. Like we're like, it, they're all a bit short, whereas like they're all not enormous, ridiculous doorstopper books. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're all like much normal. Yeah, yeah, normal books. <laughs> oh, goodness. It's like okay. the, the three the three levels of bread as books. So you got like this series, which is like, you know, nice and slim. You know, like the, the Mistborn trilogy and and Elantris, which are decent length chunks. And then you got Stormlight. Yep. Which uh, are actually for you guys, uh, since you guys get the UK copies generally, they're divided into two books because they are so long that they couldn't be published in one book. Ah, crap. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm going to. I got really excited. And it was a couple of months ago, but I don't know if I brought it up on the show. We had Dak's birthday and I try and usually find a book that he's never read before um, just to give him something else to read. And I went into the bookstore and there was this whole shelf of Brandon Sanderson and there must've just been something else come out. Maybe rhythm of war had come out or something. I don't know. It's just the one sticking in my head, but it might not have been that. And I was like, Ooh, <laughs> Brandon Sanderson. I was like, I can't read any of this. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> James like, I got to stay away from this shelf. Okay. <laughs> but I mentioned, um, the last episode of the one before that, like I've got some friends who read Brandon, um, and one of them, I was talking to one of them on Friday night, and he was just like, a, "Oh yeah, are you reading this book? Are you reading this book? Are you reading this book?" And he brought up Emperor Soul, and I was like, "Yes, yes, we did that one. We've already done it." And he's like, "Oh cool," and so we bantered about that, and then he was asking about, was it, what was it? He said he messaged him to me, uh, Legion and the Reckoners. Like mm, he was, and he was yeah. just like, "Oh, are those on the do- on the docket for you guys?" And I'm like, I've, I've no idea. I don't think those are Cosmere. So no, those are non-Cosmere works. So, and we we get this we get the question a lot. Like, are you going to do these non-Cosmere things? And so, my answer is that I have every single thing he's written on one uh, Word document in the order that I intend for us to read them in. All the Cosmere stuff is first, but all that other stuff is absolutely on there. And so, uh, Legion actually, uh, that's one of the one of the earliest things that is on my list for non-Cosmere titles. But yeah, he has okay. a bunch of stuff. He has stuff like Legion and uh, and the Reckoners series takes place on Earth. And so Earth isn't in the Cosmere, so anything on Earth just is automatically like, oh yeah, that's not. So, uh, but those are real interesting. The I like the the premise behind both of these things. And then he has he has a sci-fi series that's, uh, the first book is called Skyward. So it's most usually referred to as the Skyward series. But uh that's also uh, really fun. That I think that may have been the most recent Brandon thing that came out was his his latest Skyward series books. So maybe maybe that's what it was that was at the. I, I think I remember seeing the, the ads for that on Facebook, like Cytonic. Yep, Cytonic. Yeah. 
And so, yeah. So all that stuff is on the list. It's just way, way down the list because it's not Cosmere stuff. And once again, that's the kind of thing where if we ever, if we're in the middle of like a a, a Stormlight book and we're just like, we need a break from, from we've, we've been going at this for a long time. Let's do a little something else. Like the Legion stories are all pretty short. We can do like in an episode or two probably. So that's totally the kind of thing that if we ever get just tired of something, we can pop over to something just completely different for a little bit of a break. So that's definitely uh, that's cool. in my head. Makes sense. So yeah, fun, fun times. And I've I've even got songs picked out for some of those. Some of the earliest ones that I picked out songs for were were there's just a miracle sound song. And I'm like, oh, that is 100% so perfectly fit for this. I'm gonna write it down, even though at best case scenario it would be like four years before we ever got to that. I'm I'm making this yeah. note right now. What you should do is like I don't know if you have Spotify or not, but you should like have the Sandalanch playlist, then it's just all the theme songs we've used. Oh, I should I should absolutely. I don't actually use Spotify, but I should totally do it just for that. Yeah, just distribute that among the followers. It's, I mean, it's oh. all miracle sound, but I don't think anyone's gonna care. No, yeah, that's a that's a good thing. Absolutely. Just mix in some <laughs> somehow published Joe's like it sucks to be a ska and mix that in to the list somewhere or something like that. <laughs> Vin- <laughs> Yeah, Vin and Orsor, exactly. <laughs> oh man. Okay. So yes. Miracle of Sound. The 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 sound of the Sanderlanch is Miracle of Sound. <laughs> and he actually just released today for his patrons only uh an, a preview of his next song that's coming out. It's based on Elden Ring. And I started reading the lyrics and I was like, oh, this is absolutely perfect for a book that's uh, gonna come up. And so I'm like, OK, I'm, I'm going to make a note on this one right now because I think I've just found a song to go with the book. It's not even actually released yet, but it will be released long before we get to any other books. So it's fine. Cool. Wait. But yeah, fun stuff. All right. Thanks, everyone, for listening and wasing to the time of next. Colo. Cool.